Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the ZOA Online Book Club. We hope everybody is doing well. We have a wonderful, two wonderful guests today. We have Bernie Marcus, the co-founder of Home Depot, and Kat, Dr. Catherine Lewis, who is his co-author of this wonderful book. I hope you can see it. Uh, Kick Up Some Dust, Lessons on Thinking, Big Giving Back, and Doing It Yourself. Um, it's a wonderful, uh, very readable book. If you haven't read it yet, I urge you to. It's a lot of fun. Um, we, we were just speaking for a minute beforehand, and I mentioned to Bernie that uh, there's uh, it, many sections that I uh, related to, one of which was uh, how the, um, li the lighting, how Home Depot made lighting accessible and affordable and before that, people used to have to pay something like $2,000 for, for the ceiling lights. And uh, then you could buy them now for when Bernie started Home Depot at Home Depot for $40. And I was just laughing because I have I have those lights. I have those beautiful lights that I bought for $40 in my kitchen that look gorgeous and look like they cost a lot more. And uh, there's there's so much in this book, so many great stories. Um, what we're going to do today is um, the co Bernie's co-author, Catherine Lewis, uh, we're doing this a little differently than how we usually do things. She's going to start off with some questions to Bernie, and I'm going to pick up with some, and then Catherine's going to pick up some, and then we'll, then we'll open it up to questions from our audience. Um, as always, please stay muted if um, you're, not, you're not speaking. You're welcome to either raise your hand for question time or to um, to write your question in the uh, in the chat. Um, Catherine, please take it away. <laughs> Great, thank you, Liz. And it's so nice to see everybody. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. Kick Up Some Dust came out in October uh, on the 18th, uh, published by William Morrow. Um, and Bernie and I worked for a couple of years to bring it to fruition. And we've been on quite the book tour uh, so we are really happy to be here. And Bernie, I'm going to start us off with the most obvious question, which is, why did you write it? Why did you want to write it? And what are the key messages from Kickstarter? Well, first of all, I would like to say something. Uh, I'd like to compliment Mort Klein and the ZOA, Zionist Organization of America. I think that Mort is a true patriot. Uh, I think that he is the uh, the one voice in America that stands for uh, Israel and the Jewish people in this country. I think that most organizations are whoops, are wussies and back off and are not willing to attack the issues. Mort is fearless and he goes after anybody who goes after Jewish people and the state of Israel. So I'm very happy to be here uh, just because of my friendship with Mort and my admiration for what he does. So let me get back to your question. <laughs> sure. Why did I write it? Um, you know, we had COVID. We were locked up. Uh, actually, everybody was, you know, in their houses. They had nothing to do. And for years, I've been talking about putting together my adventures, and I call them my adventures, <laughs> yeah. uh, for, my co for my grandchildren and my children, and for people that I know who really don't know the full story of Home Depot. Uh, it, it's a, it was a journey, a real journey, and it wasn't until Catherine came aboard with me, because Catherine has this wonderful technique of taking my words and putting it on printed paper and making it come out the same way I meant it, which is really unique and unusual. And it, it, it turned out to be an adventure. Uh, going back in my life and thinking about all the things that happened to me, um, it wasn't, I'm not a whiz kid, you know, who formed an app and all of a sudden, you know, became very wealthy. It took years and years of hard work uh, it took years and years of uh, grinding out 60-hour weeks and 70-hour weeks in the businesses that I represented. And finally, in creating the Home Depot, 
which was a mitzvah for those of you who are Jewish, uh, for people who own homes. Uh, and all of a sudden we created this do-it-yourself business, which people never had an opportunity to do. So it, 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 it was a, uh, it's a blessing. And uh, Liz, you're, you're, what you had with the lights, people have with plumbing, uh, people have with other things in the house that they're able to do themselves because the people in Home Depot are there to help you and to lead you through every project. And so it's a great company. I haven't been there for 20 years. I've been out of the management for 20 years, but it's the same company as when I left it. They're wonderful people, 550,000 of them who work every day to make the lives of people better and, and, and more productive. And you walk into a Home Depot store and they ask you what project you're working on. They're really interested. They really want to know what you're working on and they're there to help you. So Home Depot turned out to be a blessing, of course, the success of Home Depot. Um, the fact that it's one of the, I think it's the biggest outside of Walmart retailer in the United States, the most profitable. Uh, their, the blessings of their stock has given me the ability to do all the things that I do in philanthropy. And so I'm forever grateful to the people that work at Home Depot for making my life what it is and, may, and giving me the tools to be able to do all the things that I do. So I think I maybe asked the question, answered the question, but I, I typically rove a little bit. That's why <laughs> Catherine is there. She kind of brings me to earth. Is there anything you want to add, Catherine? <laughs> I know I would say uh, the best part about the book is really looking at how Bernie uh, sort of invented do it yourself and then took that very concept into his philanthropy that Bernie doesn't write a check. The Marcus Foundation doesn't just write a check and walk away. Uh, they very much put the same energy, use the same business skills, all the same great customer service uh, that they used in Home Depot uh, to really do transformational philanthropy. And we'll get to that uh, in a minute. But Bernie, I wanted you to talk for just a minute about growing up in Newark, uh, growing up Jewish in Newark. Um, you have stories in this book about your synagogue, your bar mitzvah, even Jewish gangs. What was it like uh, to grow up in it uh, was in it was like growing up in uh, the Bronx, yeah. and uh, it was a tough neighborhood, really tough. And I did not grow up in a prep school area. Right. It was every day was a fight. Every day was, you know, difficult for me. Uh, Fifty percent of the population was black. And uh, we lived in poverty. I lived in mm -hmm. a, a tenement. We lived on a fourth floor. And I remember, you know, in the summers, we used to go out on a fire escape and put, you know, stuff down and sleep outside on a fire escape. And in the winter, we froze our tuchuses off <laughs> because there was no heat. And, uh, you know, we, we lived in this, this, uh, this apartment where the only heat was in the front where we had a little stove and the further back you went, the less heat there was. Mm -hmm. And of course I got the last, the last bedroom, my sister and I, and we froze our butts off. But the truth is we didn't know because everybody lived that way. All of my friends had the same issue. So we didn't feel sorry for ourselves. Um, I think from an early age on, I wanted to figure out how to get out of this and how, how somehow to live a better life with my family. And, uh, you know, I had to learn from people who were successful. And I think that that's what made my life good, listening to people who were successful, mm -hmm. not envying them, uh, emulating them. And uh, that's one of the lessons of life that I learned. But Newark was a tough place. Absolutely. And you have to great it had a great Jewish population. Mm -hmm. 
we had, you know, we had uh, delicatessens and we had, you know, I mean, there's, there's nothing that we didn't have that you didn't have in, in New York and Brooklyn mm -hmm. or, or, or Manhattan. Uh, and it was just a great life until the riots came. Mm -hmm. And of course, then the city was destroyed and never came back. And the Jewish population just moved out. Right. And so, and, and went all over and scattered all over. So um, it was, but, but the years that we grew up, all of my family were within walking distance, my aunts and my uncles, who all came from Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would visit and 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 uh, and uh, help each other, and uh, it was it was a different kind of life. But Newark was, you know, if I say special, I think it gave me character. I think I learned how to live and how to cope and how to deal uh, because of the travails that we went through in Newark. Mm -hmm. Not easy, Catherine. Indeed. Well, and you'll have to read the book to learn about all the stories, uh, especially how you joined a Black gang, how you became a hypnotist in the Catskills. Uh, but we'll leave that to the, to the audience to read about. But I want to talk for a moment before I hand it to Liz about your mom. She was such an early influence for you, Bernie. And the Pushka box in your kitchen um, shaped your life and has shaped your giving even to this day. Can you talk about that? Yeah, my mother, who suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, who was basically uh, incapacitated, uh, she had me when, when she couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. She was bedridden, and the doctors told her that the only way she would walk again is to have a child. Mm -hmm. And my mother and father, don't ask me how they did it, she was in pain 24 hours a day mm. with rheumatoid arthritis in her hands and her feet and her legs. And she had me uh, after a miscarriage. They went back and they tried again. And I was born on Mother's Day, believe it or not. Right. My mother got out of bed and walked. So I was the miracle in the family. And um, my brother was 12 years older than myself. I was like a schlepper, you know, I, I was in everybody's way. I, I wasn't meant to be there, but I was there. So I lived a pretty independent life. I went where I wanted to go. And I, I think for the first, you know, 12 or 13 years of my life, I, I was very independent. I went to places nobody went to. I went to Yankee Stadium, Ebbets Field, uh, Giants Stadium. Um, all by myself, got on a train, went out, uh, went to the circus, worked at the circus, putting the tents up. There, there are stories in here <laughs> that are, you know, you say, what, a, what is this guy? You know, where the hell did he come from? <laughs> uh, all of these things form the basis of who I am. And uh, all of it was kind of exciting in my bringing up and, uh, and yes, I did hypnotism on the stage. I worked at Catskill Mountains. I, I was a waiter. Um, I started as a busboy, a waiter. Then I ended up as an MC, and I did hypnotism on the stage, and um, uh, lots of experiences. Well, and the Pushka box, uh, your mom would take your ice cream money in the rare occasion that you got ice cream money. Oh, she would. Why? She would put it in the Pushka. And I would say, uh, you can't do that. How do you do that? Take my take my ice cream money away and put it in a pishka for people I don't even know. And she said, you have to do it. It's tzedakah. And that's what we do as Jews. And it's true. That's what we do as Jews. And, and you know, it's interesting um, that there are statistics. I think we have... We're a half a percent of the population, and yet in philanthropy, we're 20 percent of the giving in the United States. Yeah. So it's way out of proportion. So most Jews live the life of tzedakah. Some of them don't even know why they do it. In my case, it was taught to me by my mother. Mm -hmm.
And that's become so important and we'll see why. All right, Liz, do you want to pick up? Sure, I'm very happy to. Um, Home, Home Depot, you know, picking up on you know the Pushka box, um, became very known for its community outreach. You know, sort of like you know, especially in disasters, sort of like you know, when Israel, you know, Israel goes to different places in the world whenever there's a disaster. Home Depot is going, you know, every place when there's a disaster. And I'm wondering if you can speak about that and why that was important to you and to your company. Yeah, Liz, um, you know, we had this theory. Part of our culture was we take care of each other and we take care of our customers. Where, who are we without our customers? Our customers, you know, have a choice of where to go. They can go to Ace Hardware. They can go to Lowe's. They can go to Menards. There are a lot of places they can go to. Why do they go to the Home Depot? Because of the quality of the people that we have working in our stores. So the key for us is to always treat people well. And it's not just them coming in the store and making a purchase. If God forbid there's a hurricane or there's a fire or there's an earthquake, any of those things, we as a company, Home Depot, rises to it and ships merchandise into those areas to help people recover. And it, it happened, it started, I don't know, in the early 80s, and it hasn't stopped. Today, when a hurricane comes out, we already have trucks packed with batteries, tarpaulins, generators, waiting to see where the hurricane's gonna hit. And then the trucks head out for that area. We don't publicize it, we don't, do advertising on it, we just do it. And the reason we do it is because it's to help our customers survive. And we really feel it's very important. Our people go out uh, on their own, uh, clear houses, cut trees. When, when, when trees come down on houses, uh, are all, everybody is involved with this and they say, it's, it's, it's a company thing. And I can't explain it. I don't know any other company that does it. Frankly, I think we're the only ones that do it. Oh, cool, Akavo. That's so amazing. It's really, really great. Um, I went to ask how, how much of some of the secrets of your success, of Home Depot success, been copied by other companies, um, such as you know walking through the stores um, to see firsthand what was going on, which you spoke a lot about, and how you know if you saw a problem, you were able to take care of it right away. Um, dedication to customer service, and I remember you you answering customer service lines yourself, <laughs> and you had some very cute stories about that. Um, the extensive training, and 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 also, what do you think in general about customer service in a lot of American companies today? Oh, I, I it's it's employees. It's, it's, it's employees. In most companies, they, they have a job. They work at it like it's a job. And they have no loyalty to the companies. And, you know, today they could be there. Listen, I was at a place recently where they were telling me 13 people were scheduled to work, to work only three showed up. This is very typical in the United States. At Home Depot, it's not a job, it's career. People join because it's career. We made multi, multi millionaires of these people. And most of the people that work for us don't have college educations. Mostly they're high school students who came into Home Depot, had a career and stayed there. Uh, so we see people that have been there I just I just uh, joined a party for somebody who was there 40 years, 40 years, still working every day, coming in every day. And, and she wasn't about to give up a job. She said, this is my life and I'm going to continue working till I fall over. And she loves the company. So it's it's how they feel about the company. Um, it's different. It's different than most retail outlets. Most retail outlets, 
they say, hello, how are you? And you say, you know, my back is broken and my head hurts. And they say, well, that's very nice. Thank you very much. You know, and that, that's it. Uh, at Home Depot, they ask you what your problem is and they help you solve it. So it's, it's, it's an unusual company. And I'm very proud of the fact that 20 years after I'm left, the culture still lives on and still goes the same way it was before. Right. Thank you. Um, do you think that Home Depot will ever bring back the Home Expo stores? I know uh, it was. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't think so. I thought the Expo. By the way, I invented the Expo stores. I love them. I thought they were great, but the manufacturers wouldn't let us discount the products. And so, what happened is that people used to come into our store. They would shop, look at what they they wanted to buy. We could not cut the price, which is not Home Depot. Home Depot was everyday low price. Mm. Had to sell it for less profit than most places. And then they would go to their local place who would cut the price and we would get the sale. I mean, so it didn't, it, it, the concept was great. Putting all these great products out in front that, mm. where people could see how they could decorate their houses what they could do with their houses, but it didn't work because the manufacturers refused to allow us to sell a product at the prices that we wanted to sell them at. So we closed it. It was unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to also ask you about your entrepreneurial philanthropy. Um, I know we touched on that a bit. And can you tell us, you know, how what you learned at Home Depot translated into this con whole concept of entrepreneurial uh, philanthropy and um, sort of related to that. I I just love the whole cloak and dagger story about um, how you built and the uh, aquarium in Atlanta and brought fish from all, secretly brought fish from all over the world. Um, and I think it'd be great. It would make a great movie. So I wanted to encourage you to make a movie out of it because it was such a fun story. And Well, well think about this. You know, we the, the, the company was started by three Jews Mm -hmm. and an Italian and an Irishman. Mm -hmm. um, pretty, pretty diverse group, right? <laughs> None of us had money. Mm -hmm. And frankly, when we moved into Atlanta, uh, I was broke. If Home Depot didn't make it, I was going to be broke. And the people of Georgia and city of Atlanta supported us, helped make us, help make the culture Southern charm, how to take care of people. We learned from them. And my, my wife, Billy, and I decided we wanted to do something, pay back. My mother said, you got to give back. You got to pay back, Sadaka, that, you know, the more you give, the more you get. And we tried to figure out what to do. They, they wanted me to build a week of a hospital. They wanted me to be a symphony hall. And... I remember on a trip from Israel, I was with the governor of Georgia and we spent 12 hours on the plane talking about what we could do that would be unique and unusual to pay back the people in Atlanta, our, our customers and our associates. And the fish came up. I love fish, big fish. And I had always gone to Chicago the aquarium in Chicago shed. And I said, why don't we build one in Atlanta? And up until that point, nobody had ever built an aquarium that wasn't on water. Now, Atlanta is not on water. It's got groundwater, but it doesn't, it, no water. And it, it took an imagination to do that. And Billy and I spent almost a year traveling around the world, looking at aquariums all over the world and talking to the management. If you could do this over again, what would you do? And they were all very open to us. And we saw all the animals that we wanted, all the mammals, all the fish. And Billy would say, I want that. Like belugas, she said, we must have belugas. And I saw the whale sharks in Japan. And I said, we have to have whale sharks. And we came back and the people who were in the business 
we said to them, we, we, want, we want to have belugas, we want whale sharks. And they said, no, you can't do that. No, you can't get whale sharks. There's no whale sharks. How do you do that? You can't. So everybody said, you can't do it. The minute they said, you can't, we figured <laughs> out a way to do it. And lo and behold, when we opened the aquarium, we had whale sharks, we had belugas, we had just about every mammal you thought of. And since then, we've expanded it. It's now the biggest aquarium in the world. And I would say the best And all, all the people that's out there with your books, put your books down, get on a plane, come to Atlanta, and you will have an experience of a lifetime. Bring your kids, bring your family. It's a whole day affair. Typically an aquarium takes two hours. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Georgia Aquarium, it's a six, seven hour trip. That's how many things we have in there that you'd be very excited about. Now getting all these fish there, imagine bringing uh, a whale shark that weighs 25 feet, that's 25 feet, thousands of pounds from Vietnam. Uh, and, and we found a way, uh, UPS had to train pilots on how to fly these, these animals in because they were in water. We had to keep them alive. They were in tanks that had life support systems and we had people flying with them. And, you know, it was like a 25 hour trip and we kept them alive. And when we put them in the tank, lo and behold, they all lived. It was an experience of a lifetime and it's continued now. The whole story of how the aquarium got built is a really interesting one. It's a built, it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a kick up some dust, start an entrepreneurial thing with no knowledge whatsoever. We had no knowledge whatsoever. And we developed this complicated, you know, 70 miles of pipe in this thing. Uh, all these engineering things that we did, uh, the, the, the water is filtered every single hour, 24 hours a day. Uh, I'm not sure there's an aquarium in the world that does that. And so we keep, we keep the fish alive and the mammals alive. And there's so much engineering that goes into it. It's a fascinating story. There is a book available at the aquarium that you could buy that tells a story. It's a fascinating story. Well, I hope I hope they'll make a movie out of it too, because it's such a such an amazing story. And oh, oh by the way, two two of our authors who we featured here also have, have movies on books that we featured at the book club. So we we'll hope we be the third. <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I see that um, Mort is uh, you know, there, it, it has joined us, and I think he, he has his hand up for a question. So, uh, Mort, could um, I, uh, you know, have you, have you say hi to us? Yes. Hi. Hi, Mr. Marcus. How are you? Nice Mort? to be with you. I, I'm actually going to Las Vegas for the RJC meetings, but my plane was delayed, so I was, I'm able to stay home for another hour or two and, and, and to be with you. I didn't think I'd be able to. Uh, by the way, I noticed, is that the Louis Brandeis Award I see in the background that we were privileged to uh, give you? I, I see the Louis Brandeis bust. <laughs> but in any event, my question is, I don't know if you spoke about it. <laughs> I don't think people are aware of the extraordinary medical research that you've uh, promoted, funded, uh, and inspired, especially integrative medicine and autism. Uh, did you have a chance to say something about that? No, we, no, no, we didn't. That was coming up, Mort. We were just about to get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mort, you, okay. Jumped, you jumped the gun. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I want to, Mort, I, I, we opened the thing and I, I want to say to everybody how important you are to the Jewish people in this country. You are the only stand-up guy that I know that's not afraid of the slings and arrows that people throw at you. And I'm proud to know you and well, proud to be a friend of yours. So, and a supporter, of course. Uh, but you're doing a great job and just keep doing it, okay? Well, thank you. I, uh, 
I don't like the slings and arrows. I endure them, knowing the work's important despite the slings and arrows. But uh, I, they hurt, but it doesn't stop me from uh, promoting what we can to help is Eretz Yisrael and the Jewish people in every yeah. way that we can. But thank you for your kind words, Bernie. It means so much to me, Mr. Marcus. Thank you. Okay. All right. So Liz, why don't we uh, so talk, let's, uh, let's talk for just a moment before we get to medical philanthropy about Jewish causes, because of course this is the ZOA, right? Uh, and they're near and dear to your heart, Bernie. Uh, Route 1, the Moden David <laughs> Blood Center, there's so much that you've done. Can you talk about why they're so important to the Marcus Yeah, I, I started getting involved with Israel about 40 years ago with Israel Democracy Institute, mm -hmm which is probably the, only, the largest independent think tank in the state of Israel today. And I started it with George Shultz. Those of you remember, George Shultz was Secretary of State under Reagan. He was a great, great patriot and, a, and loved the state of Israel. And he worked as hard as I did in trying to develop democracy in the state of Israel. Uh, and we started the Israel Democracy Institute 40 years ago. And today, I think, you know, Mort, I don't know, you know, you know more about what's happening in Israel. It's probably the only voice of sanity in, in the state of Israel. It's not Likud, it's not labor. It's, it's what's good for democracy and how to make Israel stronger. That's what it's, it's meant for. And, uh, all the things that started budgeting, a little stupid thing like budgeting in the state of Israel, budgeting was like a joke. Uh, the Department of the, the, the Ministry of Finance actually determined where the money was going to be spent in Israel. Members of Knesset had nothing to do with it. And re really, even the prime, prime minister had nothing to do with it. And we changed that whole dynamic over the years, and I think it became a very uh, strong organization. Of course, one thing wrong with the state of Israel, Mort, which is if they don't do it one day, it's going to be a disaster for them, and that is they need a constitution, and they don't have a constitution. And for some reason, and, and we developed the constitution, we almost got it passed, we came close, and um, but you need courage from the politicians, and they didn't quite have it. And so we still don't have a constitution. So you have all these questions now, like, this, like the uh, you know Supreme Court, and where what the power of the Knesset is, what the power of the Prime Minister is. It's not defined. And there is no democracy in the, in the Western world that doesn't have a constitution, except the state of Israel. <laughs> it's, it's all fakat. You know what I mean? By fakat. I can't understand what the All right. So uh, that's that's a sad issue, and it's one that IDI is continuing <laughs> to work on. And maybe with Bibi coming back into power, and he has more power than anybody had before, maybe BB will find it in his repertoire to now try to institute a, a constitution. And you're quite right, Mr. Marcus, if you can hear me, and because there's no constitution, what happens is the Supreme Court makes decisions based on what they think is right, not based on what the law is or what the majority of the people want. It's based on what this small group of people believes it should be. That's no way to have a Supreme Court. Well, there are a lot of things why uh, the power of the Knesset, you know, what is the power of the prime minister? Right. Nobody defines it. And so, you know, you could, you could look at all of these things and say it doesn't work. It hasn't worked for all these years. What is 70 years? Right. And they still don't have the, the, the kishkas to pass a constitution, which eventually if they don't do, will lead to very serious problems in Israel. Now, if they, if they make changes in the Supreme Court now, you're going to have a schism in Israel, which is not going to be very healthy. 
And, you know, with the ultra right uh, disagreeing totally with the justice, with the uh, Supreme Court, um, there's going to be loggerheads. This is not healthy for the state of Israel. It's better to do things in a logical fashion, in a smart fashion. But, Lord, I don't know where it's going to end up. I know which side you're on. I'm on the side of logic and uh, doing it intelligently. And so I think allowing the Supreme Court, allowing the Knesset to overturn the Supreme Court by one vote, a civil majority, it doesn't bring law and order. I just don't, I just don't, don't believe that's gonna work. I think it's gonna be unhealthy. And um, I personally don't think that that's going to be a benefit to the state of Israel. Um, so cooler heads, there are smarter people in Israel. Believe me, there are geniuses in Israel. They're the smartest people in the world. But in some ways, they're schmucks. <laughs> so, Bernie, can we get back to Mort's question about medical philanthropy? Because yeah. I think in some ways that's such an important part of the book and such an important part of your work. Well, there are multiple areas that you do, but talk about some of the work with autism and stem cells and cancer. And well, you know, you, you left yesterday before we finished the meeting and we now have a treatment that we're gonna go into clinical trial and we're gonna pay for the clinical trials of the Marcus Foundation for rebuilding the retina for people who have macular degeneration. Now, this will be um, like a re an evolution. Uh, people who have been blind a year or two may be able to get their sight back. Not all of them, uh, but, but we, the, 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 the research that we're doing, building a platform that goes in and replaces the retina wow. and rebuilds the retina is is like amazing. How many people do you know who have macular degeneration? So this is a godsend. We hope that it works. It's going into clinical trials now. Uh, we also have, uh, the reason I want you to stay, Catherine, we also approved a treatment for bronchiectasis, mm -hmm. which is something that probably 30% of the population suffers with. That's, can that's a, a um, a lung issue, mm -hmm. and we have a another uh, treatment for that. Um, autism, as you know, we had a presentation. We we started the Marcus Autism Center forty years ago mm -hmm. when nobody knew what autism was, and today it's the largest single place in for autism in the world. And uh, we now have a tool that we developed where we can, we can, we can uh, decide that, we, that a child at three months of age is autistic. And if we get a hold of that child at three months, we could change the way that child's life will turn mm -hmm. out. Now, you, that's a big deal. That is a really big deal. And that started 40 years ago. Um, because a woman that worked for me who had a child, we didn't know what it was. And um, we just researched it. We brought experts in. And what the hell do I know about autism? I remember I sell hammers and saws. <laughs> but, I, but we found the right people. And you're just like the Home Depot. You, you have the right people working for you. You have people who you don't know what they're doing and they're, um, they're motivated to do it. Uh, and you end up with something that nobody ever expected. Of course, that's what the Autism Center had. And there's so many things that came out of it. It's just like a miracle. So that's only, that's only you know, one of the things that we did in, in medicine. But you know, more, one of the things that we're, we're doing now we started something called Route One, which <coughs> you should be interested in. 
you know, anti-Semitism on the campuses is out of control. Uh, you have the Palestinians and you have the administrators and the, and the, the professors, all anti-Israel. And when a Jewish kid gets on campus, they are decimated. They're enveloped and they, they struggle with being attacked. And uh, RU1 is an organization sending sophomores and juniors, high school kids to Israel, not for 10 days, but for three weeks and letting them know exactly what happens so that we, when they get back to the campuses, they know how to fight anti-Semitism. They know how to fight anti-Israel. They know the facts. They know what's true, and what's not true. And facts always win. So we're, what we're doing is educating them. And I, I hope that some of your, 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 your people that are out there, Root One, it's called Root One. And it's uh, something you should support. It's something we need all Jews to support. <laughs> and Bernie, it's spelled just for people who haven't had a chance to see it. It's root, R-O-O-T-O-N-E. Um, and it's a wonderful precursor to Birthright, right? Which is a little <coughs> bit later. Uh, but, uh, you know, I know you and I talked about it, that the idea that you do your bat mitzvah, right? You might do some more Hebrew school, but then you have kind of a gap in your yeah. education when you get to college or in, in, and certainly to high school. So Route One helps fill that gap and then Birthright mm -hmm. picks that up, which has been really nice. So Bernie, can you talk a little bit about um, the liquid biopsy, uh, which has been extraordinary that I know the FDA is, uh, is working on? The one for cancer, Johns Hopkins? Yeah. Well, we have a simple blood test that we did about 50,000 people that that blood test could determine whether or not you have pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, all the cancers, a lung cancer, all in the first stage, which there is no test for today. Uh, this is the only one that we're aware of. It's before the FDA. We hope it's approved this year. Uh, and it's, it's out of Johns Hopkins. And mm -hmm. if it is, it's one of these things where you go to your doctor, you get your regular blood test, and if you have pancreatic cancer in a first stage or second stage, where it doesn't normally show up until a fourth stage, when it's too late, there's a possibility of saving your life. So I think it's a very, a very important piece of of uh, research, and it's going to be very. It'll be a protocol in the United States, it'll be very important to save people's lives. And what about, uh, Bert, yeah, I was gonna say, Bernie, say, Liz, Liz had a question about uh, persistence. Liz, I'm sorry, I, I skipped ahead a little bit on us, but I know you wanted to ask it. You're muted. I wanted to ask you about protecting the MDA um, blood facility from attack, which combines mm -hmm. both um, your Israel um, it, it, you know, con concerns and love together with, um, you know, your medical uh, philanthropy, which is so important. Well, you know, that story is a friend, of, a, a, somebody who was associated with our foundation, a doctor, in fact, was in Israel and he came back and he said to me, you know, that the blood in Israel is unprotected. I said, what do you mean? He said, if there's a bombing, they can wipe out all the blood supply in Israel. And this one blood bank supplies 98% of the blood for the soldiers, for the, for the hospitals, for everybody. And it's not protected. And the next time I went to Israel, I looked for myself and they showed me what they do, how they were moving, you know, when there was a bombing, they, how they moved it from one room to another to try to protect the blood. And I said, this is crazy. This is like nuts. And uh, we got involved with it and we kind of promoted it and pushed them. And they came up with a blood bank, the Marcus Blood Bank, which is three stories deep in Israel, a direct hit. 
cannot put it out of business. So it's this is this is protected blood. Ninety eight percent of the blood in Israel is now protected, uh, and it's Mogan David, uh, and and it's it's. It's in a place where they can get to every place. It's right on the highways so they can get wherever they have to go. <laughs> and they train all the people and they collect the blood. Uh, Mort, you know, with all the things in Israel, here's a practical thing. This is like practical. And the government was doing nothing. <laughs> I mean, how much sugar Amazing. is that? Amazing. God bless you, Mr. Marcus. You're incredible. In fact, because of this extraordinary story, I'm going to go to your store and buy another hammer. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, and Bernie, what's extraordinary about the blood bank is not, it doesn't just help Israelis. It, it You can have an ambulance anywhere in the country in three minutes. And that's for tourists. That's for residents. That's for anyone. Uh, well, it even, is an even extraordinary Arabs, thing. Even the Arabs. Of course. Uh, get yeah. the blood. Yeah. So, uh, certainly Israeli Arabs, but... They 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 share it with some of the Palestinians as well. Of course. So it's it's pretty pretty important. It's very I I haven't seen it. I saw the pictures of it. My kids were there for the opening of the place, and it's very it's overpowering. In in uh, and and the most important thing is that the blood is safe mm -hmm. and. It, 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 it's protected against everything. A uh, direct hit. Uh, it's protected against gas, poison gas, everything. And uh, it's a very important part of Israel now today. And uh, we're happy that we helped stimulate it. We're the original sponsors of it. And we've been fighting it from, from day the day we started. And we finally got it done. And I think it's going to be a good deal for Israel. Well, and Bernie, you told a story just on Monday about the stroke center. Of course, your work with the Grady Hospital and the stroke center about it becoming a model for the entire country of Denmark. Can you talk about that impact? Yeah. Yeah. We started the Marcus Stroke Center in, in at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. And there is a treatment for people who have a stroke where they go up through the groin into the brain and dissolve the stroke that started at the Marcus wow. Stroke Center. Mm -hmm. And the protocol has now spread around the world. Uh, Denmark uses it for every hospital in Denmark. Uh, hospitals in Germany are now using it. Hospitals in the United States all using it. And we changed the dynamic of how you deal with the stroke. At one point, uh, they believed that a stroke, that if you had a stroke, you had to get treatment within four hours. Well, now they proved, the Marcus uh, Stroke Center proved that it, you can go 12 hours, which, which is very important. So people who had it, because you don't know when they had it, they might've gotten it during this, while I was sleeping, and wake up in the morning and they find they're paralyzed and um, they, they can be saved and brought back uh, to life and live a normal life and get out of the hospital the next day. It's, it's kind of amazing. Listen, I don't do any of these things. I, we, we, we find the right people to do it. And, uh, and we have, we're very fortunate that we found the right scientists and the right people who are able to, you know, do the things that we try to do. <laughs> well, and Bernie, can you talk for just a second about one of the goals of the book was to encourage other people to kick up some dust, right? You don't have to be a billionaire to do it, but talk about what, what you want people to do when they retire. Well, you know, we have people on our own board, the, the Marcus Foundation board. We have young one young man that started a camp for children who can't go to camp because they have cancer or they yeah. have dialysis, they have kidney problems. Yeah. And he built a camp where now this has started 20 years ago. Easily. This Doug and, Hurts with Camp Twinley. Yeah, Doug Hurts. He takes, mm -hmm. they carry, 
10,000 kids a year, 10,000. Now, <coughs> he's a businessman. What the hell does he know? He kicked up dust. He decided to do something. You have a guy like Mike Milken, who decided that he was going to beat prostate cancer. And look at what he did. He brought the, 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 the death rate down from 50% to 5%. That's all. That's all done by him. He's a stockbroker for crying out loud. He hired the right people, surrounded himself with these geniuses, and they came up with the treatment. And, and what I say is that more people that you are in touch with who have made money, who are sitting on a lot of money, who have really creative ideas, once they retire, they, they hang their brains up somewhere. They put them in mothballs. And what I'm saying is, don't put them in mothballs. Go out and do something and do something that's meaningful. And it doesn't mean you have to have a billion dollars or a billionaire. If you listen, I started in, in philanthropy when I didn't have any money. I joined the City of Hope on a board. I don't know, 40 some odd years ago. And I was on that board for 35 years. And we did some extraordinary things <laughs> and I didn't have any money. So people could do it if they, if they get off their asses and they kick up some dust and, and <laughs> wake up their brains. I mean, the key is to wake up your brain. Don't let your brain go to sleep. These entrepreneurs who are making a lot of money for some reason, they think that, you know, they go out the pasture, they play golf, uh, they buy big boats, uh, they buy a place in the islands, and they go to sleep. And I'm saying you could do all those things and still do something good for society. <laughs> well, and Bernie, Mr. Marcus, you yeah, go ahead. I, was just I want to say, yeah. I spent, before I was at ZOA, I spent 20 years doing medical research with the great uh, Nobel laureate Linus Pauling. Ah. And, during that, uh, and during that period, I worked with Mark Levine uh, on ascorbic acid and cancer and heart disease. Are you still involved with Mark Levine? I know that you were a major funder of Mark Levine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we think that vitamin C and mm -hmm. we've, had, we've had clinical trials is, is very, very, um, and Mark has been a, you know, the, this is, something he's pushed for years. Um, and we believe in it. It's alternative medicine. It's not expensive. And people that have, for instance, a sepsis, that there's a treatment for sepsis where people are near death and you give mm -hmm. them high doses of vitamin C, you bring them back. And uh, we had a clinical trial. Unfortunately, the FDA didn't read it the way uh, didn't read it the way we did, and frankly, um, so it kind of fell apart. But sepsis, we know that it does work. It doesn't work on everybody, but my God, if you have sepsis, the chances of you surviving are slim and none. And if you get vitamin C. Heavy doses, I mean, really heavy doses intravenously, the chances are you're going to save your life. Well, and Bernie, this sort of leads to the issue of failure. And I know, Liz, you had a question yeah. about grinding <laughs> away, right? Yeah, and when you, you're... You, wrote, you wrote in the book about uh, grinding away and not yeah. getting discouraged, um, which I thought was wonderful advice. And it's actually something that, that we do at ZOA, for instance. We, uh, after ZOA, uh, worked on writing and then lobbied for the passage of the uh, Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995. We ground away for another 23 years trying to get uh, <laughs> one president after another to finally move the embassy and, and um, you know, and, and without getting discouraged. And, you know, many of these projects, many of the things that we work on are, you know, just long-term efforts to get the right thing done. And, and you gave wonderful advice about not being discouraged and continuing to push. And I'm wondering if you could say some words about that. 
you can't you can't give up. You have to fight for what you think is right. And there are many people who are, who try to stand in your way that don't understand what you're doing. And it's easy just to quit. It's harder to stay with it. But if you stay with it long enough, you can beat them down. Well, and we do a lot in the book about failure. Uh, right, that just you know what you do in the face of failure, um, and have a whole big chapter uh, sort of on it. But Bernie, I want you to talk about something you talked about at the very beginning, and I know some people are putting some things in the chat, and we only have just a moment or two, but I want to let you kind of close it out uh, about. Uh, and this is really a, a question that Liz sort of framed, which was, how does giving increase your happiness? And that takes us to our giving is better than getting, uh, right? You've always believed that, but can you talk for a moment about that? Well, there's a word in Jewish called the Shema, and it's like your whole being, and uh, you save a person's life, or you do something that saves a lot of lives, and the, the value of that is incomparable. It's better than making money because you saved a life which means you save the life of a person <laughs> that has a mother, a father, there are children, grandparents involved, and it's so meaningful. So I just think that everybody should get involved with, with doing something good for somebody. It'll be good for you. You'll feel good about yourself. It'll make you a better person. Well, and Bernie has all these questions. You want to go to questions? Yeah, and I so I've got a, a couple of them in the in the chat, right. and one of them, Bernie, is just, we only have a minute or two, but just tell the quick story that you wanted to be a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And you have this experience, and you get into Harvard, and they say you've got to pay a bribe of ten thousand dollars, which was not uncommon in right. this period, the anti-Semitism. Um, uh, so you go on to become a pharmacist, right? Uh, but how did that early experience shape you? Obviously, you have a great love for medicine, um, and you're you're a trained pharmacist and know a great deal about it. Well, I think I think it's listen. A Jewish kid trying to get into Harvard Medical School today is no better off. It's it's the same thing. More the world was turned around. You know, I'm 93 years old, and what happened to me in the 50s is now happening today. So if you're Jewish and you're a brilliant student and you try to get into Harvard, the odds are you're not gonna get in unless somebody in your family's there. That's mm -hmm. what the odds are. Right. So it's anti-Semitism all over again. And we certainly see that. And if you look in the chat, Bernie, I know you can't see it, but people have made all kinds of wonderful um, observations. Um, uh, Bernie, you're the best straight talk. I love the phrase, don't hang up your brains when you retire, <laughs> which I think is great. Uh, thank you for the thoughtful presentation. Um, thank you for all you do for Israel. So we have what we're on the money at two o'clock. So let's close it out with the last question, Bernie, which is what is one major thing you want people to take away from this book? Well, I'd like them to read the book because I think that the story of Home Depot, of how it started, how it came about, is a fascinating story. Plus, I'm very, very, very lucky in my life that here's a kid bro, grew up in Newark in a tenement, and I have had the ability to be presidents, prime ministers, uh, you name it. Uh, how does that happen anywhere in the world? It doesn't. It only happens here in America, in this great country of ours. And I must tell you that one thing I have to tell you, I love this country. I think that this country is the best place in the world. And people that knock it, you know, they just, you know, let them go where they, where they think. Let them go to Venezuela or Cuba. Let them go to Russia. Let them go to China. That's why people are trying to get into this country because it's such a great place to be. And the American dream, which is what happened to us, this is the story of the American dream. 
of somebody who started with nothing and ended up with a lot. And it could only happen in the United States. On that I have note, to, I have to just say one thing. One yeah. thing I have to say, yeah. President Trump asked me to publicly send his best regards. He said that he loves you and that you are a great man. So I have to let everyone know that that message was uh, asked of me to deliver to you. So I've done that. And Thank Bernie, you. everybody does love you and you are and, a great man. And there's, <laughs> there's so many wonderful comments blessing you and thanking you and now thanking Ward also in, in, in the chat. Um, we'll have to try to, to download those and send those to you. They're really, okay. you know, People well, Liz are, and Alan really and so happy with all the things you do, you've done and you know talking about what immense you are really really thank you so much for joining us today and Liz yeah. Alan and Mort thank you so much for including us Bernie great job I know you've got a busy schedule uh but uh but great to see you great all to right. see you and I just wanted to mention to everybody that we have another wonderful book club coming up on December 14th on the classical case for Israel um, by Professor Block and Professor Fuderman, um, and hope to see you all there. Um, if uh, Alan or, uh, or if we have, if we or Jackie has the uh, link to that, maybe you can put that in the chat. And if not, we'll be getting, we'll be sending out uh, our flyers about that. And, and please watch out for that. It'll be a, another wonderful program. And thank you, Bernie. This was and Kathy, right. this was great, and the book is great. And I hope everybody will buy it. It's a really, really thank terrific you. read. It's a great Christmas present or Hanukkah, however you want to do it. <laughs> Bravo. So, thank you. Bravo. Thank you Bye. so much. This was a thank wonderful, so wonderful, wonderful program. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bernie. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Love Liz. Bye. Fabulous. Thanks. Thanks for uh, coordinating this, Liz and Mark. Yeah, thanks. My pleasure. This is great. Let's see. I don't know if you can hear me, but it was great. Thank and you so much. Thank you. How do how do I get to to do it again? <laughs> uh, We're gonna and, and will you have it available for my family members? I want them all to hear that. Yes, because we'll, we'll we'll be posting it on the ZOA uh, site, and also JBS might be might be reposting it, rebroadcasting it. Okay, so CUA has don't... a YouTube. CUA has a YouTube channel. So, no, I don't do the. I'm I'm pushing ninety two myself, so I don't do the YouTube. I don't do all this other fancy stuff. Will it be where I can see it someplace, like on an email? Um, we can try to send you an email. We can try to send you an email, Anita. Oh, that would be wonderful. Okay, when, once it goes on. Of course, on... of course, we all shop at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. This is great. Thank you, everybody. Thank everybody. you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Take care. Yes. Bye-bye. Thanks.